Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India first lecture of module th 3 of game theory and economics. Uh, what we have done so far, let me recapitulate what we have done. We have introduced the idea of game theory, what it means and what are the basic assumption of this uh, whole uh, premise of game theory. Uh, and we have also uh, in module 2 discussed <coughs> uh, what is known as a Nash equilibrium and uh, what are the assumptions, conditions of Nash equilibrium. We have also talked about uh, equilibria like symmetric equilibria when they are applicable, symmetric Nash equilibrium. We have also talked about uh, uh, things like dominated actions, strictly domination, weakly domination uh, and what are the examples of such uh, domination. And we have also discussed various examples uh, how to find out the Nash equilibrium in a particular game. <clears throat> and we have talked about best response functions also. We have seen that best response functions can be useful in finding out Nash equilibria, uh, especially when the numbers of the number of actions is uh, more than one. And in fact, if it is close to infinity, then uh, we don't have any other way but to depend on best response functions to find out the Nash equilibria of a particular game. <clears throat> What we propose to do in module 3 uh, in this module is that we are going to discuss various applications of game theory. Uh, in particular, we shall be talking about uh, six uh, applications. Uh, the first two applications will be from the domain of economics and these are number 1. Kuno oligopoly model Bhatra oligopoly model. So, these will be from the subject of economics. Then we shall be talking about what are known as electoral competition. So, this is uh, from political science and of course, in economics also there is a sub discipline of economics called uh, uh, political economy. There also uh, uh, pol this models of electoral competition are used. <coughs> then we shall talk about what is known as Power of attrition. We shall discuss our auctions. And finally, accident loss. So, this is from economics, this is from economics, this is from political science. This is uh, mainly from biology. This is auction theory. Auction theory uh, is studied as a part of economics itself. 
and finally this is law. <clears throat> so uh, what we are trying to do here is to look into different subjects like economics, political science, biology, etc., etc., and we try to see whether Nash equilibria, the idea of Nash equilibria uh, gives us any hint or does it give us any fruitful prediction as to what outcome will occur in each of these six cases. Uh, there can be more than one outcome of course. Uh, so just to briefly talk about these six cases, in first and two we are going to talk about oligopoly markets. Uh, what are oligopoly markets? Well, in economics when we study markets, uh, we divide markets generally depending on the number of producers. We assume that the number of producers is same as the number of sellers. So, there is no difference between a retail seller and a wholesaler and a producer. We assume that just the producers are producing their goods and selling it in the market without any intermediary of a separate layer of sellers as such. <coughs> So, uh, in economics the markets are divided according to the number of sellers. In monopoly there is a single seller. In perfect competition that is at the other extreme there are infinite sellers or you can think about a very large number of sellers that is called perfect competition. In between we have this case of oligopoly. So, oligopoly is the case where the number of sellers is not one, more than one, but it is not a very large number either. Uh, so, we can say it is a few uh, number of sellers, uh, a few number of sellers are there and uh, they compete within themselves. Uh, but the question is how do they compete and depending on the answer to that question how do they compete, we can divide the markets into two oligopoly markets into two market, two kinds of market. One is the Kuno mar market or which we shall be studying here in Kuno oligopoly model and the second is Bartra market <coughs> which we shall also be studying. The difference is that in Kuno market or in Kuno model the producers are deciding on their production level, they are not deciding on the price price is determined in the market. Uh, so, price is outside the control of the sellers. On the other hand Bartra market or in Bartra model, the producers are deciding at what price they are going to sell their goods, uh, but how much they are going to produce that is going to be decided by the market condition. So, in first case it is the quantity of goods that the producers are producing that is in their control. In the second case it is the price which is in their control of the producers, but both are the cases where the number of producers is few. Few is a vague term, but nevertheless we do not have any uh, precise definition uh, as far as the number of uh, producers in oligopoly market is concerned. Okay, now, in the in third topic that is electoral competition, we are going to talk about how the candidates uh, in a vote in, a in, an, in an election decide on their agenda depending on the preferences of the voters and can we predict uh, what agenda they will pick up and what will be the equilibrium. Uh, in the fourth case, we are going to talk about war of attrition. Uh, here, suppose there are two competing parties who are competing over some common resource or common uh, target. For example, it might be two hunters uh, targeting the same prey. <coughs> now, these two hunters will then like to inflict uh, damages on each other because uh, only one of them will going to get the, will get the prey. So, this kind of competition between, uh, between players who are trying to get a common resource or common prey will be studied in war of attrition. <coughs> uh, we can think of this case as not hunters and prey, but we can think of uh, this as two companies who are fighting over uh, a 
it's a very valuable employee, for example, and they are trying to uh, employ that particular employee uh, by you know outsmarting the other player. <coughs> Fifthly, we are going to talk about auctions, uh, where auctions is a very commonly used term. <coughs> the people, the pl players are trying to uh, again trying to get a same the say the same resource or same uh, commodity and they are trying to get that commodity uh, by bidding. It might be there will be different kinds of bidding that we are going to talk about. You can see that there is some similarity between war of attrition and auction because in both cases uh, the object uh, th that uh, the players are after is the same and the players are basically fighting within themselves to get that object. And finally, in say, uh, topic 6, we are going to talk about accident laws. Uh, so, if an accident happens, there is one victim and one person who has caused the accident. Let us call that person to be the injurer. Now, uh, it is easy to figure out that if an accident happens, maybe some blame of the accident uh, is lies with the victim and a part of the uh, accident also lies with the injurer. For example, if a pedestrian is crossing a road and a uh, car runs him down, then uh, the, the blame may lie in either side. It may be lying in both sides also. For example, the pedestrian might have been careless while crossing the street or the car might have been uh, very rash. So, in such cases, how shall the state, how shall the government frame the laws such that the, this kind of accidents, when they happen, the, the damages that have to be paid by each or borne by each are fairly distributed. So, we are going to talk about those laws, which laws are most efficient and which are not. So, in all these cases, we are going to use the idea of Nash equilibrium and game theory to see uh, whether we can predict uh, the, 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 the outcome in the real world through our uh, tools of uh, Nash equilibrium and game theory. So, let us start with this Kuno oligopoly model. As I have just said that it is go, going to be a model of market. So, in a market uh, basically there are two sides in a market. One is the side of the sellers who are producing the good and selling it at the market and then there is the side of the buyers, the people who are demanding the goods. Uh, before we go into the details of this Kuno model, let us be clear about the general uh, uh, general structure of this model, oligopoly model as such and in specific, specifically Kuno model. What we are going to assume that suppose there are n producers, n is any number greater than 1, but not very large obviously and suppose the outputs or let us say output levels. of producers are suppose q1, q2 dot 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 qn, where qi is any number between 0 and infinity, i goes from 1 to n. All right. And we are going to assume that the goods that they are producing are homogeneous. What does it mean? It means that producer 1, the, the output that he is producing 
is it looks exactly the same way as the output of producer 2 as the output of producer 3 etc etc so uh, it means that the, there is no brand name as such there is no label over the products that the producers are producing so it is not like you have the cold drinks market and in the cold drinks market you see different brands of uh, brand, brands of cold drinks produced by different companies so you can make the difference between coca cola and pepsi for example but here we are going to assume that uh, does not matter where the cold drinks are coming from uh, the producers are making the cold drinks in such a way that the, the buyers cannot uh, distinguish between the product of one producer from the product of the other producers so that is why we have said that the goods are homogeneous they are similar <coughs> now suppose q capital q is the summation of all this output levels produced by all the producers so producer 1 is producing q1 amount of output so q1 might be 30 and Q, Q2 is the output produced by producer 2 suppose Q2 is equal to 15 and let us suppose there are only two producers Q1 so there are uh, Q1 and Q2 only there are no Q3 or Q4 etc etc so here the total supply in the market which is given by Q let us put S here to denote supply so QS is the supply in the market this QS is equal to Q1 plus Q2 that is 30 plus 15 which is equal to 45. So this is the total uh, supply in the market. Now once we have seen the supply side, now we must also talk about the demand side. When these goods are being sold, this 45 units of goods are being sold in the market they must be getting sold at a particular price now how is this price going to be determined let us suppose p is the price per unit of the good now remember that p that player 1 gets that producer 1 gets must be equal to P that producer 2 gets because their goods are exactly the same it, they look the same way if they look the same way the quality is the same then uh, price also must be the same because the product the consumers are not able to make the difference so they are going to pay the same price now if price is P then one may uh, wonder how this price in the market is being determined at what price this QS is being sold in the market to understand that question to understand the uh, answer to that question we must look at the demand side now so demand well uh, to make things clear <coughs> what we say that in the market that there is a law of demand what does it mean that quantity demanded inversely related to the market price so suppose q is quantity demanded now when we say q is quantity demanded q d q d is the quantity demanded in the entire market so think about this that there is a rice market and the number of producers are there and they are selling the rice in the market and from the side of the consumers the customers they have their demand for, for rice suppose at a particular price level 20 suppose price level is 20 
I am demanding 5 kilo of rice, the other people are demanding in total 100 kilo of rice. So, the total market demand at 20 rupees uh, per kilo will be 5 plus 20 that is uh, sorry 5 plus 100 is equal to 100 and 5 kilo of rice. So, that is the total demand in the market which we are denoting by QD. But the point is that this QD is not constant, it is not fixed. QD is going to be affected by the market price. Uh, in this example, when the price was 20 rupees, I was demanding 5 kilo of rice. But suppose uh, market price rises, uh, from 20 rupees it jumps to 40 rupees, then uh, I might find it economical to consume something else, maybe wheat, I may shift to wheat then I will not demand 5 rupees of rice, I will I, maybe I will demand 5 kilo instead of 5 I will demand 3 kilo of rice. And other people who are demanding 100 kilo of rice, uh, if the price goes up to 40 rupees per kilo, they might demand less, they might demand 60 kilo of rice. So, if the price in the market for any good rises, the demand for that has a tendency, tendency to fall and vice versa that is if the price falls then the demand might increase. So, there is an inverse relationship between price in the market and the quantity demanded. So, this is written as the following QD is a function of P where DF DP is negative. All right. Uh, now, a question may arise that uh, if the commodity that I am demanding uh, is extremely necessary, uh, I cannot live without it, then if the price goes up, uh, will I be able to cut down its consumption? Will I be able to demand less? Well, it is true that in some cases this law of demand this inverse relationship between quantity demanded and price may not hold. People will not be able to cut down their consumption even if the price rises or it may happen the other way also. Suppose there is a good which I am demanding, but I do not like to consume uh, a lot of it. So, I have reached the, reached the saturation point so as to say of that uh, good and in that case if the price falls even then I will not be buying more of that good. Uh, nevertheless, so there are these exceptional cases where quantity demanded may not respond to the price in the expected way. But overall, if we look at everybody's consumption, everybody's demand, sum them up, then there is a tendency, not always true of course, but there is a tendency that quantity demanded varies inversely to prices. So, that is what is known by uh, this law of demand. <clears throat> so, we have two things now, one is quantity demanded which is given by F p where F dash p is less than 0 and the other is quantity supplied which is supplied by all these people all these producers. Now, uh, before we go further from here, it is uh, I can also write this taking the inverse of this P is equal to F inverse of QD that I, I can write and uh, so this can in a very simple way instead of F inverse so P uh, can be written as a function of Q and this is known as inverse demand function
in demand function what we had is quantity demanded as a function of price if p was rising quantity demanded was falling and vice versa uh, in inverse demand function it is just the opposite opposite in a sense that we have taken the inverse we are expressing p as the dependent variable on the quantity demanded which is qd and here also the same thing will happen because if there is a uh, inverse function if i if there is a uh, function which is downward sloping uh, and monotonic and if i take the inverse the inverse remain a downward sloping function and monotonic so uh, this is called the inverse demand function but what is required in the market is that what is known as an equilibrium equilib what is equilibrium equilibrium demands that quantity demanded quantity demanded must be equal to quantity supplied what does it what does it mean is that uh, if quantity demanded is not equal to quantity supplied then there will be movement in the market and the market is not in a state of rest the equilibrium the notion of equilibrium that it's a state of rest uh, in this in this context of course nash equilibrium has been used but it's a, it's in a different state of it was in a different context in that case the notion of nash equilibrium that was it it's, it was a steady state here so the steadiness or stability is inherent in the concept of equilibrium so in this case quantity demanded if it is not equal to quantity supplied uh, take this case that uh, in the market uh, at the current price suppose again the price is 20 rupees uh, quantity demanded is 100 and the quantity supplied is 50. Now, can this situation go on forever? Is this a state of rest? And the answer is no, because if the quantity demanded is higher than quantity supplied, what will happen is that people who are demanding uh, goods, uh, they all of them will not be able to get the goods. Uh, so, people are demanding 100 kg and the supply is 50 kg. So, what will happen in, in the market, the demanders or the people who are demanding goods, they are going to push up the price in the market. So, P here is going to rise, it is not going to stay at 20 rupees. Uh, and so, since the P is changing here, it means that this is not a state of rest. And similarly, if just the opposite thing happens suppose this is what is the case the demand is less than supply then what will happen that the sellers who are taking this all this 100 kgs to the market will not be able to sell this 100 kgs because the demand in the market is only for 50. So, what they will do is to compete among themselves and they are going to uh, reduce the price so that they are able to sell their goods. So, as a result price will fall and so again it is not a state of rest, there is a movement here. So, uh, the moral, moral of the story is that if and only if Q D is equal to Q S, we are going to have a state of rest, prices will not move and that is known in economics as an equilibrium situation. <coughs> so, in equilibrium people who are trying to buy goods are able to buy goods all of them at the prevailing price, people who are trying to sell goods are able to sell goods. There is no dissatisfaction as such, if there is no dissatisfaction then there is no reason for price to move. So, this is the basic idea of uh, market equilibrium. Now, here in our model what we had is the following, 
q s was the summation of all these q y's and q d was a function of p. If I now impose this condition equilibrium condition q s is equal to q d uh, let us suppose is equal to q then we must have then summation q i equal to q is equal to f p right and which means that p must be equal to uh, you can write it q s also and this is what we have denoted as p. So, so what is happening here is that if I have to know what is the price in the market, the equilibrium price in the market, given that all these producers are producing Q1, Q2, Qn amount of output, what I need to know, what I need to do is to sum all these Qis, get this Qs all right, and put that Qs in this P function. And if I put that Qs which is equal to Q, the equilibrium quantity into this p function I will get the equilibrium price. So, that is the crux of the entire thing. This gives me the equilibrium price in the market. This is the, this can be also be represented in terms of a diagram. So, this along the vertical axis we are representing price, price per unit along the horizontal axis we are representing the quantity, total amount of quantity that all these producers are producing together. I know the demand function will look like this. This is the demand function downward sloping and this is what is known as supply q s this is the demand and at the where they are equal is at the intersection point so this is the intersection point and therefore this let us call this p star is the equilibrium price and you can see that as these producers changing their QS, this equilibrium price is going to change. For example, if they decide to produce more output, then this equilibrium price is going to go down to P dashed. And uh, the, it will happen the other way also. If they decide to produce less output, then it is going to shift this way and equilibrium price will go up. And what is happening is very simple that uh, all the producers taking together they are producing certain level of output. If they have to sell that le level of output, that quantity of output, then there has to be a particular given price. Uh, that price is the equilibrium price at which they will just be able to sell that level of output. If they now decide to produce more then to make the buyers buy that extra amount of output, higher level of output, price must go down otherwise the buyers are not going to buy. Uh, on the other hand, if they decide to produce less amount of output, uh, then for all these outputs to get sold and for equilibrium to happen, it must happen that price must go up because at the previous level of prices, if the output goes down then there will be some unsatisfied buyers uh, who are not getting their goods even if they are ready to pay that p star amount of price. So, now the price must go up so that there is no uh, unsatisfied buyers and there are no unsatisfied sellers as well. So, that is what is happening here. Now, let us this was the general story of a market equilibrium. <coughs> this was just to uh, introduce uh, uh, the basic underlying things to students who are not familiar with 
the market equilibrium model. So, in this Kurno model, what is our purpose of studying this model? Our purpose is uh, the following. Firstly, we are going to find out how the outcome in this in this market by outcome we mean what is the quantity which are being bought and sold and what at what price they are bought and sold. How this quantity and price uh, are going to be affected firstly by the demand conditions. For example, suppose the consumers are demanding more goods, then how the price and quantity are going to be affected? Also the profits of the producers, how are they going to be affected? We are also going to look at the question, if suppose there are some technological advancement, for example, if the producers are now able to uh, produce goods at a lower cost, uh, then how is it going to affect the market equilibrium? Will the quantity of goods produced uh, in the market going to go up? Is the price going to go down? Uh, what is going to happen to the profits? Uh, we are also going to look at the number of uh, firms, I mean if the number of producers go up or if it goes down, how is it going to affect the competition in the sense that is the total uh, quantity in the market going to go up, is it going to go down, what is happening to prices, what is happening to profits, etc, etc. So, these are some of the issues that we are going to address in this model. So, there are in general n number of producers, we shall also call them firms <coughs> and uh, when they produce something, output of a particular producer, this is the output of producer i. But when you are producing an output at level of output, then there must be some cost that you have to incur. So, cost we are going to represent as C i which is also of course a function of Q i. Uh, so, C i is the cost, uh, what more can I say about C i, what kind of function it is? It is going to be an increasing function because if the producer is producing more, if Q i rises then obviously cost also rises. So, C i prime is positive. Uh, now, let us look at the profit of this producer. Let us call it pi i. Now, what is profit after all? Profit for any producer is the total amount of money that he is getting by selling his goods to the market, that is what is known as total revenue. The total amount of money uh, a producer gets by selling his goods in the market minus the total cost, the cost that he bears to produce that level of output and this must, this entire thing must be a function of Q i. Uh, so, this what is total revenue? Total revenue is the quantity I am selling which is qi multiplied by the price that I am getting per unit which is p. So, this is the total amount of money I am getting by selling my goods in the market minus c i q i qi this is the cost total cost that I incur to uh, produce qi level of output. Now, what is p? P now if you remember is this, this is the equilibrium price in the market. 
this is the price which will prevail in the market if I produce QI, QI and other producers are producing their Qs. So, it is a function of there is a QI here and QN minus CI QI. So, this is the profit of, of this producer in general. Uh, so, here the this, this is remember this P as a function of Q1 plus Q2 plus Qn is nothing but the inverse demand function. So, and inside that in inverse demand function not only Qi is there, but all the Qs are there. And here we have this inkling as to why game theory is important here. Now, we can figure out that uh, pi i is not only a function of Qi, but it is a function of so many Qs and which is the basic crux of game theory that my preference or what I am getting out of this entire thing, it depends not only what I am doing, but it also depends on what other players are doing. So, what the producers are going to do here is they are going to get trying to get uh, as high profit as possible. So, each of them is trying to maximize this one. But this pi i which they are trying to maximize is not only a function of what they are doing individually, but it also depends on what other people are doing, what other producers are producing. And there is coming the, the element of interdependence. And since we have the, interdep the idea of interdependence, people's payoffs are getting affected by the actions of other producers, we can profitably use the idea of game theory here and Nash equilibrium. So, let us write it down in terms of game theoretic model then. First is who are the players? N producers, actions, output levels, because that is what they are uh, uh, deciding on <coughs> output levels, how much they are going to produce. And this output levels can be any number between 0 and infinity. And preferences profit function q i this is what they try to maximize. Now, what we are going to do in order to look uh, and discern the equilibrium in this model in this oligopoly model is we are going to simplify it a little bit. Uh, in fact, considerably, we are going to assume that n is 2, that the number of producers in this market is just 2. This is just to simplify, we are going to then generalize this model uh, by taking n as any number greater than 2. Secondly, we are going to assume that C i, which is Q i, is C multiplied by Q i for for all i 
there are only two firms, so I do not have to bother about. So, it basically means that the cost function for players are same in the same in the sense that uh, their cost functions are represented by C which is a constant C is a uh, number greater than 0 and uh, the total cost is just that C multiplied by by the quantity that they are producing. So, in, in a sense that C, this C small c is the unit cost of production. So, if they want to produce one unit of output the total cost is C, if they want to produce n units of output the total cost is just n multiplied by C. And we are going to assume that uh, P this is the inverse demand function. takes a very simple linear form uh, this is represented by suppose equal to 0 if alpha is less than q. So, this is a very simple linear uh, representation of the demand function. You can see that it is of course, a downward sloping line uh, as q rises this alpha minus q obviously falls, uh, but that is true only when alpha is greater than equal to q. Uh, this is important because if q is greater than alpha then uh, this first formula gives me a negative the first line gives me a negative p. Uh, and price can never be negative. So, the minimum value that P can take is 0 and which will happen if uh, Q is greater than alpha or Q is just equal to alpha. So, this is represented by a diagram suppose this is P, this is Q then I have this downward sloping line it is in fact of line which creates a 45 degree angle with the, uh, this axis x da q dashed axis and uh, this intercept is alpha here also it is alpha and uh, this tot this demand function is, is in fact this part plus this vertical part. So, this is the demand function in the market. So, this is again a simplified uh, approach towards this oligopoly model. We have simplified a lot of things. Firstly, we have assumed that the number of producers is not a, in general n, it is 2. We have assumed a cost function which is again a constant term plus the a constant term multiplied by the uh, output level q i and we have assumed a linear demand function. Now, after doing this our model becomes simplified and then how do I write the profit function. Now, before we write and profit function and try to find out the Nash equilibrium let us be clear as to what we are trying to do. We are going to try we are going to find the Nash equilibrium in this model. Now, how we are going to do this? Uh, here what is happening is that the number of actions is infinite. If you remember q i is the action and q i can take any value between 0 and infinity. <coughs> and if there are infinite number of actions obviously, we cannot just construct a payoff matrix and find out what are the Nash equilibria. Uh, so, what we are going to do is to find out the best response functions and from the best response function of these two players we are going to apply the idea that the Nash equilibria or equilibrium it lies in the intersection point of the best response functions. So, our task is to find out the best response functions and then try to see at what point the best response functions uh, intersect. So, to do that 
what we need to do is that we are going to look at the preference or the payoff function of the players and try to maximize that payoff function because that is what the players are doing. Uh, and uh, then we shall get the best response functions because what is the best response function? It is that it gives me for a player, gives me that action of that player uh, which is best for him given what the other players are doing. So, if we maximize this with respect to QI, uh, then we shall get the best response function of this player i. And so, we get the best response functions of these two players, there are only two players here and try, try to find out what is the equilibrium. <coughs> So, that is the strategy of uh, approaching this problem. So, here uh, if I look at suppose player i, his payoff function is what? It is q1 multiplied by p which is a function of q1 plus q2 minus c of q1 and this is equal to alpha multiplied by minus q1 plus q2 minus cq1. Now, from he here I can take q1 common and what I get is alpha minus c minus q1 minus q2. But remember this is going to happen if capital Q is less than equal to alpha. So, here it means that uh, q1 plus q2 is less than equal to alpha and this is if q1 plus q2 is greater than alpha then this part the first part becomes 0. Uh, this first part becomes 0 and then the second part uh, is just minus q1. So, it is minus c q1 if q1 plus q2 is strictly greater than alpha. So, this is the profit function of player 1. So, similarly for player 2 it will be q2 multiplied by So, the next task is to maximize, maximize either of these functions and find out the best response function. So, we are going to maximize subject to q1. Now, if I do that, what do I need to find out? What are the first order and the second order conditions? So, what is the first order condition? The derivative of this, this is 0. So, if I take the derivative of this has to be set to 0 and so alpha I am just using the product rule and I have to express q 1 as a function of q 2. 
So, this becomes alpha minus C uh, minus uh, Q 2 divided by 2. Uh, is the second order condition satisfied? Well, what I need to check is that this has to be less than 0 and is this less than 0? This is nothing but alpha minus c minus q2 minus 2q1. This is coming from here, second line and this is nothing but minus 2 which is less than 0. So, the second order condition is satisfied. So, the first order condition which is giving me this is the best response function. So, the best response function of producer 1 is q1 this. Now, uh, one has to be careful as to what is the range, what is the range uh, uh, for which this is true, because if you remember here there was some range, uh, but does the same range apply here also? Let us uh, check that out. Uh, remember the profit function, if I draw the profit function, how will it look? The profit function is this. Now, if q1 is equal to 0 or q1 is equal to alpha minus c minus q2, profit is equal to 0. That we have seen. That is clear from this, this profit function itself. If I put q1 is equal to 0, the first element is 0, so the entire thing becomes 0. If I put q1 is equal to alpha minus c minus q2, the second term becomes 0, which means again uh, pi 1 is equal to 0. So, if I have to draw this curve, how will it look? Suppose I represent this q1 along the horizontal axis and pi 1 along the vertical axis. And I also know that uh, this thing is true. Which means this curve, uh, pi 1 curve is a, is a concave curve. And it is a concave curve and it is cutting this horizontal axis at 0 and at this point. Suppose this point is um, alpha minus c minus q2. So, it is going to be like this, a concave curve which is cutting the horizontal axis at two points. And uh, there is a point at which it is reaching its maximum value and that maximum value is alpha minus c minus q2 divided by 2. Uh, but I know that if q1 exits alpha minus c minus q2, then this profit is negative and in that case the firm 1 will not produce anything. So, this best response function that I found out is true only if alpha minus c minus alpha minus c minus q2 is either 0 or positive. If it is negative, uh, then the firm is not producing anything. So, best response function will be alpha minus c minus q2 divided by 2 if alpha minus c my is uh, greater than q2 or equal to equal to 0 if alpha minus c is less than q2. So, this is what is the best response function of player 1. 
we shall proceed from here in the next class. So, uh, before we finish this lecture, what we have done here is the following. We have introduced the idea of Kuno uh, model of oligopoly. We have tried to find out uh, what are the main aims of studying the Kuno model of oligopoly. We want to study the equilibrium in this model and how this equilibrium is affected by changing demand condition, changing cost conditions, changing level of competition. All of this we are going to study here. Uh, <coughs> and uh, in doing so, we have seen that what we are going to do here is to find out the best response function and then try to see what is the Nash equilibrium. So far, we have found the best response functions. In the next class, we are going to look at the Nash equilibrium. Thank you. Explain the idea of market equilibrium. So, uh, what happens in a market equilibrium? If we have a market, then there are basically two sides in the market. Buyers demand goods. Okay. So, we shall call it the amount of goods that they are demanding will be called Q D and there are sellers who supply goods and this we shall call it as Q S. Now, in an equilibrium these two must be equal that is Q D the amount of goods that, it, that are uh, the amount of goods that is being demanded in the market at a particular price must be equal to the amount of goods that is being supplied in the market at a particular price. If that happens then we shall call that situation as a as an equilibrium situation because that is a situation of, of state of rest. Second, introduce uh, Kuno oligopoly model in case of disequilibrium in the market, what is or are the variables or variable that adjust in this model. So, uh, Kuno, Kuno model, Kuno oligopoly model. So, there are basically many sellers, but not infinite let us say n in number, n can vary from 2 to any number which is less than infinity, but not a la large number also. There are n sellers in the market and they sell similar goods, let us say sell homogeneous goods. and at a price. Since the good is homogeneous, the buyer cannot make out whether the good is coming from seller 1 or producer 1 or producer 2. So, the price for each of these producers, the price that they will get for each unit of a good is going to be the same. That is why we say we are saying that it is at a particular price. What adjusts if there is disequilibrium if suppose demand is equal to not equal to supply then what adjusts in this market is the price. Price is the adjusting variable ok. Uh, last question what do the producers maximize in Kuno market find the best response of firm i from 1 whose cost function is q 1 square and which faces inverse demand function p is equal to 2 minus q 1 minus 2 q 2. So, what do the firms do in Kuno competition? 
firms maximize profits. This is our kind of uh, benchmark assumption though there could be uh, variations in this we can sometimes say that they maximize not profits, but output or maybe maximizing their market share, but this is the kind of uh, benchmark model that they want to maximize profits. Okay, now, let us take this particular exercise if uh, firm 1 has cost function q 1 square and the inverse demand function is given by 2 q 1 minus 2 q 2. this is the demand function inverse demand function. Now, we let us suppose that pi 1 is for one's profit this is nothing but p multiplied by q minus the cost function okay, and this is 2 minus q 1 minus 2 q 2 minus q 1 square. Now, this is supposed to be maximized by firm 1. So, the first order condition is uh, this from this we shall get this and if we simplify this then what we get is q 1 is equal to 1 minus q 2. Now, this is true if this thing within the bracket is positive or 0 that is if q 2 is less than or equal to 1. If q 2 is more than that then obviously, this is going this is going to be negative which is not possible. So, we are going to assume in that case q 1 is equal to 0. So, that is it. Thank you.